دكتور اذا امكانيه تحل الصوت من عندك دكتور أيمن الصوت مش طالع دكتور أيمن دكتور أيمن عم تسمعنا؟ الصوت عند حضرتك مش طالع اذا في امكانيه بس تفتح المايك المايك مفتوح دلوقتي؟ تفضل اه طيب شو اي ستارت اول اوفر؟ يس وي دنت هير ا وورد يس ويل ويلكم اجين ايفري ون بوث اون زوم اند سوشيال ميديا تو ذيس ييرز Arab Graduate Students Conference uh, organized by the Arab Center. And uh, I am uh, particularly delighted to uh, welcome back, I should say, uh, Asma Isakuti, who is uh, one of our very own. Asma uh, finished her MA in Comparative Literature at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies uh, uh, with a thesis um, on the genealogy of voice, uh, the book of those who have no book. And uh, before arriving at the DI, Asma actually had also uh, obtained uh, her MA from the University of Moulay Ismail in Morocco in uh, Arabic literature with a thesis on metafiction and the question of pleasure. And she has now uh, moved on to Berlin, I'm delighted to say, and she is pursuing her PhD uh, in Arabic and Islamic studies as a fellow uh, at the Arabistic Center and uh, at the Free University of Berlin. And uh, Asma's uh, research interests focus on questions of translation and untranslatability, as she will tell us today. And of course, on comparative literature and on particularly on questions of fiction and narratology and voice as well. Uh, Asma will present for about 30 minutes or so, uh, after which I just have a few uh, brief comments. Um, my detailed written comments will be delivered to her uh, in due course, but uh, my comments will mainly aim to open up the discussion. So I will not um, uh, speak for long, but just to deliver a few comments as I said to um, open the discussion, after which Asma will be will have the chance to respond, and then we'll open up the session for uh, colleagues who wish to uh, comment or offer some questions and interventions. Without first, further ado, uh, Asma, you may begin now. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Ayman, for the presentation. I uh, my paper today is titled "The Missing Link Between Hariri and Shidiyak. And uh, the missing link is a euphemism for uh, the age of decadence or asal uh, inhitat. The plan would be brief. I just to put some facts uh, out there, and then uh, the discussion I, I guess would be more fruitful. Uh, I just want to discuss what is the age of decadence. Why did Arabs ad adhere to that narrative of inhitat, although it was insulting to them? And the three shifts that frame this missing link. Uh, I would like to start uh, by a uh, personal experience is that I remember the first day in the uh, comparative literature program in the introduction day when we were presenting ourselves and so many of us uh, had referred to the inhitat. For us it was a fact and uh, for long it was uh, that way that I perceived uh, the history that I, after the Abbasid there was nothing and there were like seven centuries of nothing going on it was sterile time and then uh, thank god napoleon happened to uh, show up in the picture and uh, to bring the civilization and uh, whatever the the narrative of the colonial uh, uh, assumes or presumes 
So the inhitat or the missing link in the Arabic history, al-halaqa al-mafquda fi tarikh al-Arab, is a euphemism for what Western society constructed as the age of decadence. The immediate, it's the immediate consequence of a Eurocentric reading of history uh, that is based on Owen Europe for their teachings that they brought with this colonialism and to be owned by Europe and by their uh, own reading of history that they try to imply uh, on everybody uh, else's culture and uh, history of thought. Uh, first of all, one might easily understand why the Europeans uh, had highlighted such a narrative uh, since it places them on the Messiah position because they came to save the savages from their backwardness. And in any fairy tale or any heroic story, uh, always the villain should be demonized and showed up in the worst scenario possible because that shows how the hero vanquished him again. And uh, the more the uh, the the villain or this backward uh, colonized people were uh, dressed in this uh, savage costume, the more it makes sense for the colonizer to be there. Uh, yet, it is hard to follow this narrative when it comes to the Arabic context. Why would they accept such a thing that it just insults them? Uh, I came up with two possible readings. The first is that, in a narrow way, it did place the Nahda uh, scholars in the same position of the Messiah because they're saving Arabic, they're saving literature, and uh, there is some sort of attributing some metaphysical powers to them because they're given rebirth to uh, literature, a second birth, uh, that the first birth had happened in the past in the Golden Age. Uh, the second reading I, I can uh, think of is that it gets them closer to Europeans. Uh, even it may, if it means identifying with the worst dark age, but at least the Europeans had dark middle ages. And now Arabs have this uh, uh, inhidat stage. And as the Europeans had surpassed that, so will we. It just it's not just to give some hope to uh, the Arabic intelligentsia, but also to force some sort of similarities. Uh, we'll see an extreme case of that with the Hussein later. But before that, I would like to start with uh, with Ernest Renan and uh, his uh, uh, lecture I in mean, science, where the, he the the, uh, the main point was that. Arabs are incapable of thinking because of Islam that makes their mind narrow and because by default of their minds and their race. Uh, he also uh, claimed that Har Arabs had no achievement of their own. They just invaded white territories where people of different races happened to be more intelligent and they took advantage of that. And he claimed that for all the philosophers that were that we call now Arab or Islamic, only Al Kindi was uh, Arab. Uh, what else? Mm -hmm. and, and then when he moved to speak about the Greek knowledge, uh, what, what he calls as a strange detour, uh, he blames the gatekeepers who allowed the Arabs to, to have access and made the, the off, their offspring, the Europeans, uh, to uh, to pass strange or awkward detour and to decipher the Greek knowledge and remove the traces of the bad translation because according to him Arabic is a language of poetry or some rhetorics but it's incapable of theoretical ideas he said I would quote him ah if only the Byzantines had wanted to guard less gently treasures that at this moment in time they hardly read. Uh, from the 8th or the 9th in case of the Pisarion or, La or Lascaris, the strange to a detour would never have ha been necessary, which Greek science arrived to us in the 12th century, Syria via Baghdad via Cordoba via Toledo. So this is the 
orientalist uh, narrative that Arab uh, Arabs are incapable of thinking because already their language is purely uh, uh, purely sensual and physical and cannot both this theoretical uh, meanings. Al Jabri had uh, at some point. Uh, got some of that, but uh, let's, let's not jump uh, uh, forward. Uh, it just, it reminds me of how George Orwell understood uh, language in the, his novel 1984, where he, there was the, the big brother uh, government was trying to put uh, this uh, new dictionary with this less words, because less words means less ideas. And uh, Jabri too had some sort of uh, the, the same understanding that the, the less language we have, the less uh, theoretical ideas we can come up with. But before the Jabri, let us stop with this uh, Taha Hussein, his book, Mustaqbal Thaqafa Fi Masr. And I find this book very, very irritating. The, <laughs> The, the main thesis is that the Egyptian mind in, it, in its own core is a European mind. It has nothing to do with the East. It has nothing to do with the Far East because we don't speak the same language. And he said that it's uh, impossible to comprehend a uh, Chinese or an Indian. But then when he came up to, uh, to get rid of the uh, Near East, uh, he found uh, a bit more difficult because there is similarities of religion and uh, of language. And then he came up with the political union, that political union is impossible between two countries of the same uh, backwardness. Uh, but I, I don't know what he's thinking about uh, political union. Is it this colonizer, if he's better, then it's okay to have this political union? I don't know what is going on in his mind. But I would like to, uh, just to quote this brief citation, I did not translate it. Uh, it's in Arabic. Uh, he said, "Inna na fi al-'asr al-hadith nuridu an nattasil bi Europa ittisalan yazdadu quwa min yom il yom, hatta nusbi hajuz an minha lafzan wa ma'na wa haqiqa wa shaklan. Ida kuna nuridu al-istiqlal al-'ilmi wa al-adabi wa al-fani, alayna an nta'alam kama yta'alam al-Europi, nashgur kama yashgur al-Europi, wa nhakum kama yhakum al-Europi." Uh, so there is this grand, big, I don't know, fantasy of the European inside of Taha Hussein. He couldn't just accept that cultures are different and he just wants to out apply it. And as, as if he was a monkey, and he was uh, open to just emulate anything that comes from this European. Well, going back to the, again, to the heroic story, every fairy tale needs a villain. And the villain, and the, according to Taha Hussein, was the, the Turks, the Turks who blocked the, the Egyptians from uh, getting to where Europe is, or maybe even getting better than European and achieving re uh, la renaissance even before them, uh, he said. The difference between us and them, in fact, is neither conventional, uh, conventional nor essential. It is rather chronological. They started their modern lives during the 15th century, and the Ottoman Turks hindered us. So we commenced our lives in the 19th century. Yet if Allah had spared us from the Ottoman uh, conquest, we would have remained in contact with Europe. We would have shared their renaissance we would have pursued the road to modernity along with them. And the face of the world would have been different. Uh, this is one of the many scenarios of the self-orientalism of not accepting the present as it is and just trying to apply this Eurocentric historical uh, his history that we have in our mind. Uh, same goes in translation, uh, Arabs uh, still, until now, blame Matab Nu Yunus for mistranslating uh, tragedia and comedia into Madh and Zem. And they say uh, in every uh, introduction or, or uh, translation of uh, poetic of Aristotle, until now, 
we we'll always find this blaming of Metabunus and uh, saying that we could have had, could have had, yeah, uh, theater 700 years ago. So it's always this, we don't want this, it, it's retrospective, it's remorseful, and I don't know, too many adjectives in my mind. Uh, going uh, lastly to Al-Jabri, Al-Jabri could be described as more of a critical when he when it comes to, to his approach to the Inhidat. Yet he repeated the same notion of not only the Inhidat, but also the Arab mind. And I, I found it weird because this notion of uh, of mind or, or al Arabi was already put to actually underestimate the Arabs and to prove that they were compromised mentally and any uh, uh, attempt to make it differently it just I think it's sort of self uttering within our own discourse so uh, the the most uh, Interesting part for me when, uh, in Al-Aql Arabi is his discussion of Al-Aql Bayani. Uh, so Al-Aql Bayani, which means uh, literature, grammar, uh, rhetorics. And uh, for uh, Jabri, it's not that Inhitat started happening with the sage of uh, Baghdad or with the Turks as Tahsin, but way before that with the a period of uh, data collection or Asr Tadween, when we picked the this nomad Bedouin illiterate Arab, and uh, then we placed him as a point of reference to get our language. And for him, he again did the same as Renan did. He actually started his uh, his argument by stating Edward Sapir and that our language forms how we see ourselves and how we see the world. And claiming that and pointing to this illiterate Arab who makes our language ahistorical and uh, purely sensual and incapable of any theoretical uh, thinking, he claims that us now we're incapable of, of fathoming what is a theoretical idea because we are still stuck with the language of the Arabi inside of us. He then added two other uh, epistemological systems, which are al Irfani. To him, it was uh, Sufism and uh, hermeneutics. He considered it uh, irrational and removed it from uh, his argument. And then the third one was al Burhani which was science or uh, theoretical thinking. But again, because he was obsessed with this European in his mind, he just projected the situation and could not see uh, and claim that science was always in the margins of the, the scene. And I will quote him in, uh, in Arabic. He said, uh, إن العلم العربي قد بقي من أول الأمر حتى نهايته خارج مسرح الصراع في الثقافة العربية وبالتالي فهو لم يدخل في أي علاقة مع أي طرف من الأطراف المتصارعة فيها لا مع الدين ولا مع الفلسفة وإنه لما له دلالة خاصة في هذا الصدد أن تخلو الحضارة العربية الإسلامية مما يشبه تلك الملاحقات والمحاكمات التي تعرض لها العلماء علماء الفلك والطبيعيات في اليونان القديمة كما في أوروبا الحديثة بسبب آرائهم العلمية وسبب في ذلك واضح وهو أن مثل هذه الأفكار كانت تقع على هامش الصراع فلم يكن الصراع في الثقافة العربية الإسلامية من أجل هدم تصور للكون وبناء آخر كما كان في أوروبا حيث كان الطرفان المتصارعان هما العلماء من جهة والكنيسة من جهة أخرى وإنما كان الصراع في الثقافة العربية صراعا أيديولوجيا so I would agree with the last sentence that it was actually political because if we see the periodization of the Arabic thought, we would see the Abbasid, the Umayyad, it's always about which dynasty was ruling. But before that, to claim that the science was never want, wanting or just engaging in, uh, in the fight to 
to reconstruct the world just because they weren't in any trials, just uh, as it happened in Europe, then I think it's just a projection. These are the, the three illustrations that I wanted to uh, point out before uh, going to the last point, which is the three shifts that occur, uh, occurred during the missing link. So uh, the first one is the, am I on good time? Because you're not saying anything. <laughs> Good time. Still, so we still it's it will take like just five minutes. Okay. Uh, the three shifts. Uh, the first one is chronotopy, uh, concerning first the, the calendar. When we talk, uh, this is uh, Jabri's claim. He says that when we uh, talk about the past, we refer to the Hijri calendar. When we talk starting with the Nahda uh, about the uh, any intellectual uh, history, we take the Christian calendar, which means that to him, he read it as a, a sort of camouflage that we don't want to see the seven centuries that nothing had happened and changing the calendars would make us think that it's less time. Uh, I think it's also a change of models because we're not referring to uh, a sacred age anymore or to the time where the Arab powers were actually in power and now we're taken to the European one. The, the second half of this, uh, of this chronotopic shift is the change of the gaze. We're no longer looking at the east but we want to go to the west. Uh, it's obvious in the Maqamat because in uh, Maqamat al-Hariri, uh, the hero goes everywhere, but it's always within the Islamic dynasty. Uh, he, they always speak Arabic. That's why he gets the money from them. But with Shadiyak, it's the hero suddenly in, in Europe. And uh, he happens to be in a very weird uh, situation, like when he wrote this... Uh, uh, Panjeric to the queen, and she did not give him any money, although he did translate it to English. But because he missed that, he did not, he did not translate the, the literary conventions that in England you don't pay the poet. But anyways, uh, the, this change of gaze was not always voluntarily because uh, in Egypt, for instance, uh, Ali Basha was sending this uh, commission and he was monitoring them. Uh, I found this interesting letter that he, that Ali Basha sent to Tahtawi because in three months he did not send him any detailed report about what did he learn in, uh, uh, in Paris. And he was really angry. Uh, I would quote the, the letter he said. We have received your monthly reports and the schedules were the, were the period of your study is recorded. But the schedules that cover the last three months are garbled, such that we have been unable to determine what did you learn in that period. Despite your being in Paris, the wind spring of arts and sciences. Judging from the little you have accomplished during the interval, you have little enthusiasm for learning and this realization causes us great distress. I don't know, it's, it, it's like some kind of employer just blaming his employee for not getting the, the sense of, uh, of his practical job that he was asked to do. Uh, the, second, uh, the second shift is a, a stylistic shift. It's from the tekelluf to the simplicity that al-maqamat was uh, just uh, language... Uh, language playfulness. It did not actually articulate any information, but it just want to dazzle and beguile the audience. But with the, with the Nahda and with, with modernity, they were asked to be simple and to just articulate the information. Uh, Al-Bustani in the 19th century has this uh, blaming tone of when addressing the intellectuals of his time because uh, they were still within the tekelluf. And then he said, is it appropriate for a man to turn 
a language that was rather a medium and a gate for sciences into an end in itself, wasting the entire life in front of the entrance, contemplating the gate's exterior engravings and ornaments, although he's positive that behind the threshold exist valuable old and new beguiling and captivating masterpieces. Of course, here implicitly, the Europeans are the ones who crossed the threshold and got to the simplicity and to the information in science, and we are just looking and contemplating at the beauty of language within this tekel of uh, tradition. The last uh, shift, I call it the, the Ahshi shift, because uh, it does resume everything of the, the three shifts that we moved from translating to Arabic because it was uh, the lingua franca of back then into translating from Arabic and wishing that we're going to be read as a, a literature, uh, world literature. Uh, and before, we have this case of Ibn Wahshiya, who wrote this long discussion and the introduction of Filah al where he was asking for a book, uh, this book that he translates from the Anbad, from the guy who owns the book and tries to convince him to translate the book. But the guy says no, and that we only, uh, and that our ancestors uh, asked us to just keep our knowledge between us. And then Ibn Wahshiya uh, argues that they told us to just keep the religious uh, part, but share the sci scientific part. Uh, the interesting part is that this book was never a translation. Actually, Ibn Wahshiya wrote the book, but just because the conventions of his era was to, that everybody was translating and to give some importance to his book, he wrote it as a translation and he put the whole discussion. And the, the, the most important part that he was arguing in the introduction that he wants to translate the knowledge of his people, the Anbat, into Arabic because it's Lugatun Nas, because everybody will read it if it's in Arabic. Uh, well, then after. Asma, you, you have about five minutes not to interrupt you. I have uh, one last yeah. quotation and then it's, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, so after the Nahda, we have a totally different. Uh, position uh, with the Nuaima, Mikhail Nuaima, when he said in Lorbal, let us translate. The beggar begs when he cannot support himself by the work of his own hands. The thirsty man begs in neighbor, uh, his neighbor for water when his well dries up. We are poor, though we brag about our uh, abundant wealth. Why then should we not attempt to satisfy our needs from the abundance of others which are available to us? Our wells have no water to quench our thirst. Why should we then not obtain water from, uh, from the wells of our neighbors, which are not forbidden to us? We are in a stage of literary and social development in which we have become aware of many intellectual needs. These needs were never known to us before our recent contact with the West. We don't have a sufficient number of pens or brains to satisfy these intellectual needs. Therefore, let us translate. I think this quotation just briefs um, in a very concise way everything that we have been saying, that it's the West. They have enough brains and pens. We just, the beggars, and we're waiting for them to actually share uh, what they have because we're backward and decadent and we cannot get out of that we actually see it as a part of the identity of the arabic history i think i'm gonna shut up now <laughs> that's it thank you very much asma i think this was a brilliant glimpse of your larger project actually uh, before i start as i said i will keep my comments uh, mainly to try and delineate or articulate certain areas of engagement, uh, which is precisely what you're doing in your project as well. Um, but before I start, I wish to uh, alert colleagues and participants who are with us here on Zoom to, uh, if they wish, if they so wish, to begin to uh, send the comments after I'm done uh, through the Q&A function on, on the screen. Um, 
this said, uh, logistically, um, I wish now to, first of all, congratulate you. I believe you have continued with on quite strongly with your intellectual trajectory since we since I last saw you, since you were at Doha in the sense that now the way you've pursued the question of the maqam is quite similar, if I remember, to the way you've pursued the question of voice, meaning maqama is a singular form, it's a singular art, and we've all uh, agreed and we all know it's a uh, truth and established uh, historical fact and literary fact of the history of Arabic literature that it's a unique Arab art and which emerged in the 10th century. Uh, and this art is almost in its own right inimitable in a way, even though it is uniquely um, marked by the fact that it's the, the major art of Arab prose practices that has never ceased to be uh, produced and composed throughout uh, the past centuries. Um, so uh, this said, I wish to, uh, as I said, uh, your talk gives a glimpse of the larger project. So what I wish to, uh, which I believe constitutes a, quite a crucial intervention in how we begin to rethink uh, Arabic literary history, or the literary histories of Arabic literature, and also to begin to theorize from within uh, Arab thought as well, um, and Arab historical, linguistic and cultural experience. Uh, so therefore, uh, very much um, enacting what you're preaching in a way, because what, uh, which I will point this out, uh, what you have tackled as the missing link was not clearly an attempt to reproduce or tackle the, the old traditional approach of what do we do with Asr and Hitat as a period of stagnation? Of course, we now have a whole range of revisionist uh, uh, historiography that uh, rethinks this question of Hitat, both from a general historical uh, point of view, general histori historiography, but also from a literary historical point of view. Um, now, this said, uh, I see three areas of intervention that are quite crucial. And of course, you're, you will, you're welcome to correct me and uh, elaborate when you respond to the comments. Um, the first area is critical theoretical, and it is the question of untranslatability, which runs through the project, uh, which I think would be good to uh, elaborate a bit more on untranslatability. Uh, it's not a concept, it's a hermeneutical practice. And it constitutes one uh, of the uh, most recent advances in rethinking the languages of philosophy, but also uh, rethinking uh, theoretical approaches to uh, world literature and to different linguistic and cultural uh, histories and experiences. So it is a specialized uh, mode of approach, which is critical, theoretical, and largely hermeneutical. So it's good to indicate, of course, or explain in the beginning also that uh, it does not denote the impossibility of translation, but mainly to engage hermeneutically at a certain juncture, at a certain border, whether it's the border of language or culture or geography or time as well, time periods. And, uh, and in this case, it's quite significant that you chose to focus on the maqama, and as you indicate also in the paper, uh, the, uh, you've chosen specifically two moments. We know the Muhammad started around the 10th century and Hariri a bit later, but it's still an extension of that moment, historical moment of uh, translation. Yeah. And then the 19th century again, which is a key moment of translation as well. So two things are happening here simultaneously. It's rethinking these historical moments through the form of the maqam itself, uh, through certain key defining aesthetic aspects of what constitutes the art of maqam, which are language, style, strangeness, or the encounter with strangeness. strangeness. Hence, you also focus on the question of encountering the other. The two moments, almost, you read them as moments of encountering otherness and 
somehow, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly or implicitly, you uh, uh, put forth the argument that it's the practice of the art of the maqama that captures best or that can articulate or embody or demonstrate the complexities of this encounter with the other, in a way. Um, so, uh, so on translatability, I think it'll be good to uh, elaborate on it more as a specific... I had to remove it from the project. Pardon? I had to remove it from the project because my supervisor yeah. did not accept it after a year. <laughs> now it's uh, about strangeness and space, language, and the, the character. But what happens is that you, I mean, your interpretive approach is, of course, uh, inspired by that. Yeah. You begin with the question of uh, periodicity, with the question of thinking the periods of literary history and thinking the Nahda as opposed to uh, what was constituted by the experience of modernity as Turaf, as the past, in a way. We have to place an origin in the past. It's a glorious origin, but it falls short of the present moment. You know? So, um, and this is the first, uh, one of the first areas of debate in untranslatability, which, which is the question of what we call Eurochronicity. Yeah. So the questions of this kind of thinking and periodization, that's completely a Western informed model. And that's teleological. It has to lead to the present moment which by definition must be a European present moment. You know? And uh, what I found quite inspiring is the way you've tackled or articulated how Arab historical thought seems to be also quite special. We think of centers, we think of Baghdad, of Cairo, of Rabat, and so on. And this constitutes our historical consciousness in many ways. And part of the shift of modernity is to transform all of that almost uh, uh, quite violently restricted to a temporal thought. Basically, the molds of 19th century historical consciousness, which is linear fashion, teleological, developmental, uh, evolutionary, and has to deal with the, or comes from the present moment, or the struggle with modernity, which is the struggle of Nahda. But Nahda itself is an untranslatable concept. Uh, time-wise, right, to begin with. So it's already, it's already there, and I think it's quite integral to, to your approach as well. Um, uh, because the question of rethinking these moments, you're not trying to uh, rehearse the old debates over the periods of uh, Arab general history or Arabic literary history, which has, as we know, uh, restricted the maqama as simply a precursor, a not so developed precursor of the art of the modern novel, basically, which is yeah. one of the major deplorable results of the period you, you've tackled as well. Uh, and of the thinking of some of the key figures you've, uh, you've critically handled in your paper, and I quite agree with your position all the way on Taha Sin or Al Jabiri or Salam al Musa or Al uh, Aqad or Mikhail Naima and so on, because they were really in their own historical moment. This, is, this was their struggle. Uh, but our struggle right now as literary scholars um, has to be different in a way. And the way it can be different is by uh, rethinking through the singularity of the art form itself. Which, has, uh, which is the way I see it. So we can read these historical moments by or through the uniqueness of the art of the maqama itself on the level of language. It's not just a rhetorical practice, it's actually an experience, an experience of the world and it's a vision as well. Uh, and it was, it, was, uh, it was an answer to the spirit of, of that time. Everybody was looking for the, these stranger characters. So. Exactly. You were trying to articulate some sort of misfit with their immediate <clears throat> reality. It's just not that they were just uh, using Saja or just language dealer. I think there is more of a humanistic aspect to it. Exactly. And it is the form that is tied to expansionism. Yeah. 
yeah. in some ways to have expansionism. So it really is an artistic mode of encountering new realities. And which is why I think it has never uh, disappeared from Arabic literary history. It has always been there. Um, and not simply as a rhetorical practice or as a practice of the best uh, that Arabic can offer as the language. Um, the, the, the shameful part. Of the Sorry. The, the the shameful part is that it's it is read re retrospectively. Now, when we study Maqamat, we look for uh, how it did uh, impact Don Quixote. Or uh, yeah, this is unfortunately this is the whole thing. I'll finish my. No, this then you can comment. But this is precisely uh, what reveals the problems of the old modes of. Uh, Arabic literary history or practices of literary history, because it's tied through this linear genealogical evolutionary line, it can only think of questions of influence, basically. And this is the only way you can tackle the uniqueness of the maqama as an Arab art, but by no means really able to delve deeply into what is it that constitutes the uniqueness of this form. Um, and also it's, a statically inherent ability to offer most of uh, articulating new encounters, new experiences in space or in time or culturally and so on. Um, which leads me to the other question, which is quite interesting also, which are uh, which is the parallel history of Amiya uh, Maqamat, the Maqamat in Amiya. So it's not just this because of those, the earlier way of thinking, it's only thinking of the high art of the maqam, whether it's rhetorical or not, but it's just the high art of the maqam, but excuse cues the continuous parallel history of producing maqamat in Amir. And we know, for example, that uh, at, right around the time you're uh, referring to and the discussions of Tahtawi and the encounters, that uh, Sheikh Attar, who was Tahtawi's mentor, and the one who Propose his name for the to join the delegation of students himself had produced a few Amiya Maqamat lampooning the French soldiers at the time of the French expedition. What's the title? It's Amiya Maqamat, uh, Maqamat al and have not been, have not ceased. And we have some present day brilliant examples in Mauritania and and in I have one classmate who's working on the maqamat in Nigeria. They're still writing them now, and it's a way to prove that you have high standard Arabic. That's the last but, thing they achieve uh, to actually but write. That's what's interesting, but it, it makes us rethink the question of language in the history of Arab thought, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, through this, this unique singular art, uh, uh, we begin to, or we, through your project as well, as well, we are beginning to rethink Arabic as a language experience, not just as, as an art or as a sacred medium or the early critiques that it was taking, bringing down the level of Arabic as a sacred language, the language of the Quran, to the level of... Uh, uh, everyday connivance and uh, charlatanism and calling people and so on, which is one of the early critiques. But it, uh, it is a mode of uh, uh, capturing artistically through language sensibility new realities or new experiences, uh, which I think is quite an important, uh, also significant uh, potential of your project as well. Uh, the the uh, the other point was, I think it would be interesting within that or to bring out this aspect to the light more, is to, uh, you refer to Shidiyak and Sakh al in particular, and we know they are only four maqamas in the entirety mm -hmm. of the yeah. Sakh al -Sakh is itself a unique, quite singular work. It's a compendium of styles and of language styles um, and different forms. So I think it would be good to begin to analyze the four maqamas within the composition of the whole of a saqa as such. And what language experience um, uh, it may, um, 
or understanding of language experience may emerge from the thinking of, uh, singularly of this work and what it had achieved. Yeah. To post to your comments on Tahlisi uh, Libris, for example, and the obvious structures uh, from within which Tahtawi had to produce. Uh, I think I'm approaching the end of my allotted time, but uh, I think uh, the project has brilliant potential on a critical theoretical level, on a formal level as well, rethinking questions of style, language, and strangeness, and space and time as well. And of course, on the level of taking us away completely from all uh, historiography, whether it's general historiography or literary history and the thinking of periodization, while doing that through generating a heuristic tool or an analytic hermeneutical approach um, that is de being developed or generated out of the singularity of the maqama as an eye of art, you know. So I think it's very exciting. Uh, Thank you. I wish you Almost good. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> but worth the undertaking for sure. Yeah, but, but it's just because all the reference, everybody who's studying them, it's just they're looking for the origin, how did it start and looking for the influence and it's very hard to find like a little thread to follow afterwards. So fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. So if you have any quick comments and then we can open it up for colleagues and participants if they wish. Um, no, I have wish to join us. Uh, shall we go? Shall we? Yeah. Uh, went straight to Q and A. Excellent. So we'll see uh, through our colleagues whether there are direct interventions or mudahalat. هل هناك أي مداخلات؟ Nothing. Let's go home. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if there are any if there are any questions on the part of colleagues or. I think Dr. Adif has a question. Uh, well, I believe our colleague uh, Ibrahim could, uh, if he's so able, could. So. Oh, I think now I can speak. You, you hear me? Oh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Asma. Uh, it's nice to see you again and listen to your contribution. Um, I have a small question or uh, idea. Um, how can we rethink the, this moment of Shadiak in the 19th century? And all what uh, what this moment uh, means in sense of Nahda uh, uh, issues, in sense of confrontation with Europe, the translation moment, all of this. How can we connect this with the moment of the, the or, or with the debate on the beginning of the Arab novel? Because it is it's a long debate and sometimes a uh, very exhausting debate about the first Arab novel and uh, why is this one the first and not uh, the other and so far. But there is also a kind of approach about the Saq al as uh, like the connection between the Maqama and the uh, modern Arab novel. I, only, I would like only to uh, know what you think about this topic, so the connection to the debate on uh, the beginning of the Arab novel. Thank you, Dr. Atu. But I would, I would quote you when you told us about the Arabic novel. You said that there is no prize for being the first novel. So, <laughs> so stop with Al Asaq being the first novel or not? There is nothing that makes it uh, particular because of that. It just uh, what makes it particular is. Uh, the, the fight, the struggle within the book, to give something to the past, 
and to try to do something with the spirit of, of this age. And uh, that's a very uh, obvious uh, struggle within Saq uh, al-Saq because he, he starts uh, in the first, there is like three uh, dedications or, or like three introductions. Uh, one uh, that starts with, uh, well, it's the custom of Europeans to dedicate their work to somebody, I'm going to do so. So he, he's just trying to follow the convention, the conventions of whatever uh, literary practice that was start, just starting to emerge. And yet he was, he had so much package because of the Nahda and because of this glorious past in his head. And uh, afterwards, in the, 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 the real introduction, he then said that this book is supposed to be a dictionary of al gharib of just putting the most stranger, uh, strange words together. Well, that's a practice from the Asr Tedwin. So he just, I feel that he was like schizophrenic. He didn't know what, what to do with the literary practices. And it's true, as Ayman had said, that it's only uh, four, four maqamat, but there is, uh, with Liazigi, it was all the uh, maqamo. So it's, it shows that there is some sort of wanting to cut up with the past, and yet it's it was a transitional era. It's not, it has all transitions. It's very hard to to find. It. My question was actually uh, more uh, if we can read in the text something what also in the uh, criticism of Radu Ashur she wrote yeah. about about uh, Shidiyat and the Sakh al as uh, kind of... Hadas uh, al yeah. Hadas and modernism and uh, the beginning of the novel. And for, for here, for example, it is like the first Arab novel. But uh, that's why I would like to know what you think about the text itself and how, it, how can you connect this debate on uh, Arab novel in general, uh, modernism, uh, Nahda, uh, trans, uh, translation and untranslatability and Shadiyat in Europe, all of this uh, concentrating in, in one moment of Shadiyat. I don't know, I don't have answer. I, I'm asking myself, how can we deal with this moment? How can we interpret this uh, very intensive moment of Shadiyat? Because I think for some reason, it's an important moment, but I cannot answer why. <laughs> it is important, but uh, uh, there is narrative elements, there is heroes, there is him and his wife and the, the whole the discussions, there is this uh, idea to, to, to show uh, some literary vocabulary, but there is also the, the Nahda going on and there is that he wants to, to go to Europe and uh, to fit in and uh, so much, you know, going on. But he didn't claim it as a uh, riwaya and the, it's only partly maqamat. So I, I don't know, but, but do we have to actually label it as something? Because that would put us in so many anachronisms. I don't know, I think Ayman is smiling, so maybe he has the answer. No, <laughs> it can be hard to come up with the answer. But it is true, he was not particularly, of course, thinking of the novel as such. Yeah. Came out in 1850, and at the time, barely were beginning to have the early um, experiments by Bustani, and very soon after that, Ali Mubarak. But uh, but he would not have been, of course, thinking. Uh, yeah. If if at all, and I I don't think there is the argument, of course, that had been put forth that Saq al Saq is almost in the in the style of the French encyclopedia as a compendium kind of work, which was, of course, had its major moment between the 1830s and the 1870s. And that's when he was in, uh, in France and then uh, working on Saq al Saq. But, uh, but I think also it has the whole range of Arab textual practices. It's mm -hmm. a musannaf, but it's a musannaf of language experience, which is what's fascinating about it. Yeah. Not a musannaf in, in the sense of uh, a particular genre as such, uh, or it's not a musannaf al-fiqh, it's not a 
المصنف في النقد العربي or uh, uh, it is a مصنف of the language experience itself in its different um, textual practices which is part of the genius of the work yeah but it's very much his own uh, his own unique singular impulse um, just sitting there and working with a with an Arabic dictionary <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but we have years we've barely begun to tackle there are a couple of in a few colleagues like Radu Ashur and a few others who have been wor- who have worked quite closely in trying to tackle the mysteries of Saq al Saq, but I think we need more and we need the type of work that uh, you're doing as well. It's not just a question of focusing on the, the work itself, but also on the larger moment. And, and as we see in Arthur's question as well, this is a very significant moment and we are we are we have yet to rediscover it again mm-hmm. there's a great deal that has gone out of print and a great deal that was passed around in, in manuscript form as well so we have yet to really even get a, a, a more rounded uh, sense of uh, of the 1830s and the 1850s and the 1870s and of course they are long 1890s Yeah. Uh, I, I attended uh, last semester uh, somebody's PhD about Shudia and he uh, labeled him as the first feminist because he, <laughs> he the, the wife has a really strong character in the Saq al Saq. And uh, it's just a shame that this uh, uh, sequence of firsts, of first novelists, first feminists, uh, it doesn't appreciate the, the spirit of the work. It just tries to project whatever is. But that is still the major is still the major trap even if we have this kind of close analytical work yeah. um, we we are still deploying the categories and the most of the old historiography of Arabic literary history the question yeah. of the first as Atif has posed it yeah. uh, which has unfortunately led to completely blinkering I mean now for example Mulih and Hadith Isa no one reads it anymore. It's only part of literary history as this hybrid creature in between the maqama and the novel, and no one reads it. So we finally have the work of Maha Abdul Megid, which initially a PhD work in, in London, and now it's coming out in book form very soon, completely reading the moment of the 1890s by rereading Hadith Isa ibn Nisha. So uh, yeah. that is to the challenge and the trap. True. Oh, the other day I was working in Tawabi' with Zawabi' and uh, whenever I look it up, and uh, okay, this is about Tawabi' with Zawabi' and then uh, it influenced the uh, Risalat al-Ghufran and Risalat al-Ghufran was and there's nothing about Ibn uh, Shuhayd anymore. So it just it's a shame it's everybody's trapped on somebody's influence and mm-hmm. they're all in the shades now but thanks to you and the new generation we're <laughs> we're beginning to come out of that awesome. exciting phase yeah. yeah well if uh, do you have any final comments i don't believe we have any interventions no i'm very happy to see you all <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Asma, and I uh, wish you the best of luck. And I wish to thank also all our colleagues and uh, fellow participants on Zoom and social media. And to remind everyone uh, of tomorrow's sessions, also in comparative literature, and I believe there's a session on, uh, on sectarianism or ta'afi. And uh, also to remind colleagues that they can register through the web Uh, website of the Arab Center as well. And finally, I wish to thank our colleagues uh, in IT who have been doing quite an impressive job as well with all the complexities of the technology and the challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Asma. Thank you.